like I said, I got interrupted in a custard shop. You ever been interrupted? Just eating my chocolate custard all by myself. And uh, this dude started asking me questions, and he said, uh, what do you do? I hate answering that question sometimes, you know. <laughs> it's like, man, I'm eating custard. That's what I'm doing. And, and he said, what do you do? And I said, well, I pastor. And he goes, well, why would anybody do that? And he, 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 he praised God in unbeliever language, and, uh, and you get it. You, you get it. And uh, so I said, well, and I started trying to explain. He said, why would anybody go to church? He said, what would motivate anybody to come to church? What, what would motivate you to start a church? He said, man, you seem like a talented dude. Seemed like you could have done anything and been. And so it got me, got me running through some things in my own mind. And so I, I've been thinking about that. And so I'm interrupting the series that I had going on to just kind of process. You know, sometimes you just got to process. Why do you do what you do? And, it, it dawned on me there's this great story in Mark's gospel, the 10th chapter, where Jesus is going through Jericho, and blind Bartimaeus jumps up in the middle of this event, and, and he embarrasses all the apathetic people in town because he goes fanatic. Jesus! Son of David! Isn't it interesting that when someone gets fanatic about getting a miracle, all the apathetic people go, shut up. Ah, why do you do what you do? See, I've always had this idea that I was teaching to one person in this room. I've always had this idea that there was at least one blind Bartimaeus in this room that would not be silenced by the apathetic religious people of the room and would begin to cry out that I have to have a miracle today. Why do I do what I do? I, I'm going to tell you because I happen to believe that one word from God can change your life. One touch of his presence can alter your world. And I happen to believe there might be just one person in the room this morning that might be desperate enough to... Yeah. Apathetic people are neither hot nor cold. And so as I pondered his question and ate my custard, I'm sitting there thinking, why do I do what I do? Why would anybody come to church? If you didn't come to church to experience the presence, and people come to church for all kinds of reasons. They come because they like the music. They come because there's good-looking girls. They come for social. They come for, they come for basketball. They come for a hundred reasons. But let me just tell you, if you're here this morning, I got one thing on my mind. One thing. And that's that Jesus would answer you back and it's always interesting that when he answers you back, he doesn't do the obvious. He, I mean, come on, it's obvious that you're screwed up, and it's obvious that you just need your life unscrewed up, but Jesus doesn't assume that you want your life unscrewed up. Some of you are going, he asks the man a question, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? It's not the only time in scriptures that he asked that question. He asked it to those initial disciples in John 1. He asked it to James and John who were wanting to seat on either side of him because they thought it had more to do with crowns and crosses. And so, what do you want me to do for you? So, so, so this morning, as I check my motives for why I do what I do, I want you to check your motives. And I want you, in your mind this morning, not just get carried along with the service, but I'm asking you, what do you want this morning? Did you come expecting something? Did you come and do you know what it is? Could you articulate it if you were asked? Because if you didn't come expecting something this morning, you're not going to get anything. So it's one thing to break the silence of the apathetic core. It's another thing to be able to answer the question that the right asks you at that moment. Completely two different things. Why do I do what I do? Why would anybody come to church. I, I, I guess it was a more valid question than I at first responded. I thought he was being snarky. And, and, and I'm good at snark. Speak it pretty well. But it, it, made me, it made me think about what I wanted to see, what I wanted to be after. And so I went back for custard the next day. And this time I looked at the guy and I said, where do you go when you're in trouble? Where do you go 
when you can't fix your problem? Where do you turn when nobody else can help you? I'm just asking. Do you understand that there are certain situations in your life that will take a supernatural intervention from somebody called God? Do you understand that church is not just a social gathering or a denominational flag? But the church is a gathering of desperate people who will never be able to find life unless Amen. the presence of God is found in the unity of that group. Why do I do what I do? What is it that you want? Okay. I hope you've been watching. Because I looked at him and I said, you can watch on the internet. You can, you can pay attention. You can get it. But I said, if you really want to be changed, you've got to come and experience it. You can't get it digitally. You have to get it. That's why blind Barnabas said, wait a minute, don't get out of town before I get to. Wow. That's your neighbor. I know what I want. <laughs> I know why I'm here. I understand. That's segue. I'm going to try to wrap up this morning. We've been talking about the king who had a heart. The prince had a heart to recognize the king who did have a heart. We've been talking about how Saul had no heart. Jonathan had the heart to scale the mountain and push the enemy back and get breakthrough. Jonathan also had the heart to recognize that God had rejected his father and found him after his heart. Say with me, after his heart. Acts chapter 13, verses 22 and 23 says, God has found a man after his heart. Say with me, God's looking for people who want his heart. God's looking for people, and the establishment of the kingdom of God is centered and focused and finds its foundation in the heart of the human being. The kingdom of God will be built except the people who have a heart after God. And so we've been looking at the king who had no heart, the prince who knew the king had no heart, and yet maintained the position until David could get there, the man who had a heart. It's all about the heart. For the pure in heart shall see God. Right? That's what Matthew says. The pure in heart will see God. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, out of the abundance of your heart, God wants you to worship him with all your heart. Apathy will never, ever, God's looking for people who are actually responding to the reality that they know what they're missing and they want what that is. So we've been talking about the king who had no heart. <laughs> There are many people that I see today, they just have no heart. They're, they're narcissistic. It's all about them. And, and the, he found David. Psalm 89. This is a great psalm I'm going to read. And it's God's response towards David, the man after his heart. God says in Psalm 89, in the message, I found David, my servant, and poured holy oil on his head. Amen. Say with me, just pour it on. I, I, I mean, when, when God recognizes a man has a heart, him. He just pours, say pours. I don't want a little dab. I want God to pour his anointing on our lives, that anointing that breaks yoke, that anointing that brings us into the knowledge of God, that, that presence. I'll keep my hand steadily on him. Yes, I'll stick with him through thick and thin. Wow! I, when God finds somebody who is sold out wholeheartedly, he said, I'll be with you through. David's going to go through some thick and thin. God said, I'll be with you. No enemy will get the best of him. No scoundrel will do him in. Wow. I love Eugene. Next time I see him, I'm going to say thank you. I'll weed out all who oppose him. I'll clean out all who hate him. I'm with him for good, and I'll love him forever. I've set him on high. He's riding high. I've put ocean in his one hand, river in the other. He'll call out, oh, my father, my God, my rock of salvation. Yes, I'm setting him apart as the first of the royal line, high king over all the earth's kings. I'll preserve him eternally in my love. I'll faithfully do all I so solemnly promised. I'll guarantee his family. And he'll write his rule. Touch your neighbor and say, I'm after that. I'm after that. I'm after the God that will take care of me through thick and thin. I'm after a relationship with him who will establish my family from generation to generation. I'm after the one who can make sure I win. Anybody that tells you God didn't intend for you to win didn't read the book. You're more than conquerors. Anybody that says, oh, you never know, they didn't read the book. God is for you, not against you. 
God is wanting to empower our lives so that even though Jesse overlooks us and our brothers overshadow us, even though we're an embarrassment to the tribe, there is a prophet sent from God who's going to call us out of the shadows into the spotlight and do with the ordinary, extraordinary things. Oh, well. God wants to move the person in the pew into the public arena so that those who have been taking the limelight will be overshadowed by the shepherd. Saul was the people's choice. David was God's choice. What you're seeing in the world today is people thinking they can choose. And the reality of it is God doesn't care what you choose. He's already chosen before the foundation of the world to use the marginal, the ordinary, to accomplish in this world the extraordinary things that only God can do. Now, I actually can understand why uh, that the brothers and dad were a little embarrassed and a little disdained and a little perplexed by David. I mean, can't you see the seven brothers and dad and here's the 16, 17 year old boy, hey, well, what did you do today? Well, I did. What did you do today? Well, I did. Well, David, what did you do? Well, I killed a lion. I think it's third this month. You what? Well, I chased down a lion and grabbed the lamb out of his mouth. And, and uh, I think it was night before last, there was a bear, and I choked the bear to death. <laughs> and, and I don't know how many that is. Go read your Bible. It doesn't say he killed a lion and bear. It says he killed lions and bears. I mean, he, he, he protected that which God had entrusted to him, and he killed the lions and the bears. And oh, yeah, I wrote a song. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I wrote that little song. How do you think that'll play? I mean, can you imagine the seven brothers going, what an idiot. I mean, come on, haven't you ever been around children who exaggerate? Yeah, the, the, the brothers are going, oh, this kid's weird. He, I mean, let's begin with, you ran after the lion? You bumped into a lion and you chased the lion? Oh, I mean, wait a minute, any normal person would run from a lion, not... Oh, well, you... you... Most of us are smart enough to run from that which is roaring at us, not turn around and run at it. But David runs at the roar. He runs at the injustice. He runs at those things that are going to oppose the lamb. He runs at it. No wonder they thought, oh, this kid, he's just weird. He's just not very good looking. He's short. He just will never, he's not normal. Touch your neighbor and say, I'm not normal. <laughs> and and, and I, then I, I begin to imagine in my own mind, what are the lessons that David learned while in the pasture on the way to the palace? I mean, did, did he, did it, was his hearing improved so that he could hear the lion as it slowly moved? I, I wonder if his hearing was developed. I, I wonder if his sense of smell, so he could smell the bear downwind. I bet that's where he learned to choose carefully the stones that he would throw. I, I bet he learned certain skills in the pasture as an unknown that someday he would utilize. He learned how to run at danger. He learned how to run at that which opposed him. He learned how to chase after the things that other people are afraid of. He learned how to sing, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? He's on my side. David understood that as the child of God, that as he took care of a lamb, God took care of him even more. You do understand that all empathy and compassion is born out of God, and that if I find myself to have compassion on a person, it's because God has compassion on me. And when you don't see people have love and compassion for other people, please understand they don't know the God that saves. David, this guy that ran after the lions and the bears. No wonder his dad said, hey, could you run this to the front? It's the first time Pizza Hut was ever delivered. <laughs> Here, take this cheese pizza and go, go up there. He runs to the front, and here's Goliath. Rah! 
and, 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 and here's another roar, and people's hearts are failing, and David goes, why? He runs towards the front lines. He runs towards that. <laughs> the brothers dismiss David. And yet he doesn't allow their criticisms to slow down his focus. He's not content with this opposition. And I, I love the way he overcomes this because Goliath comes out and roars. You ever had something come out and roar at you? You ever had something come out and just scream at you? You ever had that, that moment that just can grate your bones? And he, it, it says that Goliath, the giant, stood up and went, Am I a dog that you would send this kid after me? But I love David. You come at me with the sword and the spear and the battle axe, but I come at you in the name of the God of the angel armies, the God of Israel's troops, whom you curse and mock. This very day, God is handing you over to me. Touch somebody and say, today, my enemies are being handed to me. Today, the devil. Today, my addiction. Today, my attitude. Today. Today, I'm going to win. Not tomorrow, not next year, not next month. Say today. The water goes to wine and the devil goes down. I See, the interesting thing about people who want something after God, they always think it's in the process. No, today is the day that you're being handed into my hands. Stand there and scare me. Anything that can scare you can go down today. Anything that can cause you fear can be destroyed in one day. Anything that can paralyze you can be removed. Anything that can paralyze a nation can be removed. Anything. This very day God's handing you over to me. I'm about to kill you and cut your head off and serve up your body and the bodies of your Philistine buddies to the crows and the coyotes and the whole earth will know there is an extraordinary God in Israel. Say, today, I own the enemy. Today, the world will know about my extraordinary God. Listen to me. If we're going to be apathetic and just play church, the world's never going to know anything. The reason the world's going to know is because we have the guts to stand up to those things that scream at us and take them down. This isn't a mamby-pamby Christian, play this, play that game. No, no. This is about facing the enemies of our lives and roaring back. It's not about shrinking back. It's about roaring back. Brandon, I didn't see you sitting there. Bless you. Love you. It's about facing up to those things that can frighten us. It's about running back at those things and pushing back at that opposition and understanding that I'm about to put myself in a position where I could be crushed. That I'm having to go at that thing that's threatening my life. That I am going into something that I on my own don't have the strength that I'm not prepared to face this 11 foot. How many of you know that you got to run at something that could ultimately kill you? That's why Paul said, when I am weak, oh my God, do you understand that if you run into the thing, that's where God's strength is going to be revealed. David was a man after the heart, the presence of God. Do you understand the presence of God is found in the fiery furnace. The presence of God is found in the midst of the storm. The presence of God is located in the lion's den of others' creation. Run at the thing that's threatening you and what you'll discover is the presence that you're after. David understood that before you can worship in the temple, you have to find God in the trial. People ask me all the time, Pastor, I don't understand why you jump and you shout and you run. Because, honey, I've been in a few tests. I've been in a few trials. I've had a few pressures. And out of them all, the Lord has delivered me. So when I get the opportunity to worship free of the pressure, I feel liberated to shout, to run, to cry out. Because I know he was with me in the fire. I think I can find my voice in the air conditioning. Some of you need to shake off that thing. David knew the places where the pressure was so great that his presence would arrive. Some of you don't understand 
where the pressure is great, his presence is greater. That in the midst of that pressure, his power will be revealed. That in the midst of that moment, I'll discover the promise of potential that's living inerrant in my life. Christianity is not about learning rules and following the rules to get to heaven. Christianity is about discovering who you are and whose you are and that nothing is impossible. Wow. Maybe we need to recognize that I will be glad and rejoice and sing praise to his name, O Most High, when my enemies turn back and they fall at your presence. I'll carry your presence. You do understand Goliath was unaware that there was a God standing beside him. The, the Goliath was blinded to the invisible God that was towering over his size. Do, do, do you understand that the direction you run determines what everybody sees? That the direction, repent and turn, the direction you run will reveal what other people see. When David began to run at the giant, Saul in a few lines is going to go, who is this boy? Well, now he's the boy that's been sitting in your bedroom keeping you asleep at night because you're having nightmares. Yeah, but who is this boy? He's the boy that's after the heart of God going to take your place. Who is? When you begin to run at the roar, people are going to go, who are you? And when you begin to run at the roar, the greater revelation is they're going to know your God. There are not enough Christians running at stuff. They're running away from it. They're running away from it. They're sitting in their pomegranate tree waiting for something to happen. Listen, we need to stand up and run at the injustices of this world, not join them. Not join them. There's too many Christians staying silent because they're afraid of what's going to happen when you stand up and say, that's not God. God's heart is different than that. He ran at the roar, and by running at the roar, by noon, this guy is down. Say, the whole earth is going to know. Listen, there are shepherds coming out of the pastures of the unknown places of the world who are going to take down the things that have been standing in the way of God's people. And that day, a love affair was born. That day, the prince who had a heart recognized the shepherd with a heart, and the kingdom of Israel began. Because that day it was solidified, the death of the Philistines, the capture of Jerusalem, the presence of the ark into the city of Jerusalem. That day, two men agreed that the will of God had to be done, and two men with a heart after God can change the world. Right. Two men. The love affair between Jonathan and David is written through the annuals of our scriptures. David would simply say, I've never had a greater love than this. Two men who love God, love one another, can fulfill the kingdom of God. Wow! Christians debating will never manifest. You know something greater than Goliath or a lion and a bear that David ran at? His own sin. At least with Goliath, you got a breath of a chance. But David had committed murder and adultery. And according to the law that he upheld, he deserved to be killed. There's no question. See, sometimes it's easier to run at giants than it is to your own sin. God, out of Makes sense. Some of you are Have a God. Play your world. Get the world out of your choice. Manipulated others to get your way your entire life. That's sin. And confronted with that sin, David trusted in the ruthless love of God. Listen, most of you today are not facing giants. But you're facing your past. You're facing the way you've lived your life. You're used to making deals, getting your way. Listen, America, 
Listen to me closely. You have reflected yourself well. God is not happy with us manipulating and defining and getting what we want. That is sin. Faced with that, David falls on his face. Are you listening to me? Say with me, you got to run at your sin. You got to run at your addiction. You got to run at your adultery. You got to run at your lying. You got to run at your attitude. You got to run at your arrogance. You got to run at it. You got to take it into the presence of God. This was a man after the heart of God. What do you want? What do you want? Listen, I need a new heart. You can train a dog to jump through trips. But the only thing that can give you a new heart is God. The only way you're going to get a new heart is God. I'm after the God this morning who in his presence can turn my water to wine. I'm after a God who this morning can wipe away my sin, change my feelings, my emotions, make me a person that he's created me to be. I want that God. I, 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 don't, I don't need... See, it's not about the lion, the bear, the mountain that Jonathan climbed, or even Goliath. It's about behind that thing that's screaming at me and makes me afraid because you do understand most people live in response to their fear. So chase the fear down and live in response to the God that can conquer the fear. Boy, it's quiet in this room. Why do you do what you do? Because i got to believe there's one person in here that says, God, you got to change me. you got to open my eyes. you got to bring me into the reality of how you created me to be. One thing I desire, and that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, that I may behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. One thing I want, his presence, because in his presence I am transformed. In his presence I am reformed. In his presence, as a child of God, I begin to reflect the reality of the one who created me. That's why we do what we do. That's why we come to church. That's why we gather together and repent and seek God. That's why we continue to chase and to challenge. Notice again how quiet it gets. Well, I'm not very motivated. Well, die and hurry up. You don't ever become a preacher to be well-liked. I guarantee you that. (laughs) Die to yourself. Throw yourself at the mercy of God. Run to the diagnosis. Run to, to the issues of addiction. Run into those things. Run at the thing that's screaming at you. Run at it. Bring God into that moment. I love this little verse. It's found in Acts. It's the echo of Amos. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up. After that, after the death, the burial, the resurrection, Jesus has come and saved the world. I will build my church. I will rebuild David's tabernacle. David's tabernacle had no veils, no chambers. There was no caste society. Whosoever wanted to come in, came in. It was open for everyone. Are you listening to me? God says, I'm going to be with the people who are after me. I'm going to be with the people who have decided that my presence is the only priority of life. Not programs, not performances, and not politicians, but his presence. Wow. I'm going to rebuild that, that, that gathering that honors his presence more than everything else, more than one's own sin. Stephen looked at me one time, a long, long time ago. He said, Daddy, he said, you know, compared to Saul or compared to David, Saul was a saint. The guy that was rejected compared to David, he was a saint. And I just kind of refused to kill the sheep and 
God committed murder and adultery. He was about 14. Made me think. See, it wasn't so much what you do or you don't do. It's how you respond. Saul said, please don't tell anybody. David said, I don't care if you tell the world. Just don't leave me. I don't care where you tell the world. Just don't leave me. See, how we respond to the lions, the bears, the Goliaths, and our sin. <coughs> Say, today, my enemy is handed into my hand. Today, the extraordinary God that I serve is going to be revealed. Why? Because I'm going to respond appropriately. The king who had no heart. The prince who would recognize the one with the heart. The one with the heart was always pursuing. Listen, I'll turn 60 in a couple weeks. Chase the Lord all my life. I agree with Paul. I have not yet arrived. I have not yet attained. But one thing I do. I press on. God's not after perfect people. He's after pursuing people. You're not after perfect people. You're in this room this morning and you've never fallen on your face and said, God, I'm yours. I'm yours. I've sinned. I've manipulated. I've tried to. But on July the 1st, 2018, I want the enemy of my soul to be taken down. I want the extraordinary God of heaven to fill my life. I won't be changed. And this is that moment. God takes the ordinary water and took, turns it into wine. Hallelujah. It's quiet in here. You, you, you can celebrate the freedom of a nation on Wednesday. And that's nice. Or you can celebrate the freedom of your soul on Sunday. Now, if I was at youth camp, <laughs> I would have wound that up a little different. But would you just close your eyes with me? Only you know what is screaming at you. I don't know. No man knows the heart of a man except the spirit of the man. I don't know. There may be a lion and a bear that's robbing from you. There may, may be a Goliath that's keeping you from growing and going forward. Or there may be a sin that is absolutely killing you. Whatever is screaming at you this morning, I want you to respond to it by running right at it. You don't have to pray this word for word, but just something similar. Jesus, I'm in trouble here. I need you. I need you to come into my life. I need you to help me face this fear and this sin. I want you. Just simply say, Jesus, I know you're the Son of God. Have mercy on me. Please forgive me. Flood my life with your Spirit. Teach me to follow you. Jesus. with me. The enemy's down. God is up. And I am free.
him who is able to do far and above everything I can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in me. You may not know it, but there's a power working in you now. And your potential is only limited by his power. Let him work in you. What do you want, Bartimaeus? I want to see. Come on, I want to see. I want to see what God can do through me. Hear me, brother. So many people want to know what God can do to me. You know why I'm here this morning? I want to see what God can do through you. I want to see what God can do through Brian. I want to see what God can do through Josh. Because if you run at God and prayed that little prayer, what God does through you, what God does through shepherds, through nobodies, through plumbers, through electricians, through school teachers, that's the real story. Can I tell you that when we get to heaven, taking down Goliath is going to be a footnote on page 87. It's going to look like nothing compared to what God does through you. I'm excited to see what God does through you. Not just in or two. Hallelujah. That's what God told me to say. Started in a custard shop. Hope you're watching. <laughs>